everyone. Welcome to our service. I ask that you stand together with me as we sing this first song. Let's worship the Lord together as we sing, Come Thou Found. Sing out with me this morning. Come Thou Found of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Hitherto thy love has blessed me, thou hast brought me to this place, and I know thy hand will bring me safely home by thy good grace. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, bought me with his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Amen. Great singing this morning. We do want to welcome you to our service. We're glad to have our pastor back with us this morning. Uh, if I could, Blake, would you open us up in a word of prayer this morning? Amen. You can be seated for a few moments this morning. Just have a couple of announcements. First, first of which is, we are having vacation Bible school this week. And uh, we are super excited about that. However, I do have some things I'd like to read to you in regards to that. Forgive me, it's a little bit long. But I just want you to be aware of the things that we've put in place this week to make this week possible, Okay. Also, first off, uh, we do ask that you check your child's temperature before coming to VBS each night. If your children have a fever, we will ask that you please keep them home. Secondly, uh, we're going to be trying to funnel everyone through registration every night. So we'll be keeping the side doors to the downstairs building closed, okay? So when you arrive uh, tomorrow... It would uh, be a good idea to get here a few minutes early uh, because it'll take you a little bit extra time to get through registration as we'll have things set up just a little bit different. When you arrive each night, you will come in through the front entrance of our downstairs building. If you're not familiar with where that is, the front entrance has two sets of double doors down there, okay? So as you come in, we'll have a, an, a, an area designated for registration. After your child has been registered, they'll step over to the next line to have their temperatures checked. And if they don't have a fever, we'll then admit them to the general assembly area to be seated. Now, there is a mandate in our city to wear face coverings in public. In accordance with that, we will recommend that you wear a mask. But because we're on private property, we will not require anyone to wear face masks this week. But if you'd like to wear one, we will have some face masks available at registration uh, tomorrow and, and every night. If you have any questions regarding that, please see me, okay? Um, I know it's going to be tough to enforce. We are dealing with young people, but we're asking that our children refrain from touching each other, putting hands on each other throughout the week. As best we can, we'll try to enforce distancing among, between ourselves. Even in game time, I've... Um, made our game leaders aware of that and asked them to modify any games as needed to make sure there's no physical contact between children. So all of this is why we've been asking you for extra help this year. We need to ensure that our young people are following uh, the practices that we've put in place to keep everyone safe. 
Uh, this year's definitely been a little bit different, but we really wanted to keep VBS on our calendar, if at all possible. So we want to try and keep just a sense of normalcy for our kids, for our families. We don't want to, you guys to miss out on, an op on the opportunity to have some fun, and we don't want to miss out on the opportunity to minister to children and young families this year. So we're excited to see what the Lord is going to do, and I thank you guys in advance for your co cooperation and your understanding in regarding all these things we've put in place for Vacation Bible School. The only other announcements that I have um, is re regards next Sunday. Uh, Sunday school will reopen next Sunday. Uh, we're excited about that, uh, 10 a.m. like usual. And then um, following Sunday school, everyone will be in here uh, tomorrow, uh, I'm sorry, not tomorrow, next a Sunday morning for our worship service because we'll be having our VBS service. And then the week following that, uh, the kids will be back in junior church. So we're excited about uh, getting back to somewhat of a normal schedule. I know you're excited about that as well. At this time, we're going to stand together again and sing our second song. I ask that you sing out with me as we worship together and sing Amazing Grace this morning. Sing out with me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone. Set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures, He will my shield and portion be, as long as life endures. My chains are calm, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me. reigns unending love amazing grace the earth shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here be be forever mine, will be forever mine, Lord, you are forever mine. Amen. Praise the Lord. You can be seated this morning. Um, take your Bibles, if you would, turn to the book of Luke, chapter number 10. Uh, we're going to look in verse number 25. Uh, we, I looked, we looked last week at some of the, uh, the problems that we are having and that we are in as far as our country is concerned and uh, our responsibility when, uh, when we're up against the wall, when things aren't going uh, uh, 
uh, the way maybe that we would like them to or, or however it is you want to look at it. We are to pray and, and trust the Lord and continue to do what it is that God has called us all to do. Well, this morning we're kind of going to be uh, looking uh, at the, the similar topic, obviously with what our country's going through. It's on every one of our minds. But uh, uh, this morning we're going to be looking uh, at what Jesus has to say about our responsibility towards each other, both uh, both uh, the saved uh, the, the church itself, how we are to treat one another, and our responsibility towards this world or the lost. And uh, we know that God's people are required uh, in His Word to live a certain way, to, uh, to avoid certain things and to do certain things. And we trust the Lord and uh, we are to live that kind of an obedient life. And at the same time, uh, we've got to expect those that are lost to act like lost folks. We don't give them an excuse uh, for wrongdoing. Uh, we just recognize that uh, they, are, uh, they are blinded by the things of this world and uh, uh, by the master deceiver himself, the enemy of humanity and the enemy of Christianity, Satan himself. Uh, and so uh, we recognize those things. Well, this morning uh, we're going to be looking at uh, a good neighbor. And no, I'm not talking about the, uh, the State Farm commercial uh, but uh, but you understand what we're looking at as far as being a good neighbor, what it is, uh, what's required out of us to be who and what it is that God has called us uh, to be. We understand and recognize that Jesus has given us uh, as his church and as his people, those who have been uh, set free that we sang about, those whose chains are gone, those who have been redeemed, those who have a hope of heaven. We've been given the responsibility of, uh, of being the church and being the mouthpiece for the Lord and being the conduit by which God uh, provides and presents uh, his plan of salvation, his good news to the lost. We are to go and uh, teach and to baptize and make disciples. And uh, that's what God has required of us. That's what Jesus gives us as an understanding as our responsibility. Uh, and so Luke chapter number 10, we're going to start in verse number 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, what is written in the law, how readest thou? And he answered and uh, answering, saying, uh, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, uh, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, saith unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he uh, was at the, uh, the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gathered, uh, uh, and gave it uh, gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I'll repay thee. Which now of these thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. We have a responsibility as God's people, as God's church, as those who have been forgiven, as those who have been given a hope of heaven, we have a responsibility to take that message uh, to, the, uh, to the lost, take that message of hope with, uh, with anticipation of delivering it to them and uh, giving them also uh, uh, the same hope that is within us. But we have the responsibility as God's people 
to treat each other with respect and to treat each other with love. So as we're going to be looking this morning at what a good neighbor is, uh, we're going to ask the Lord to, uh, to bless in our service and uh, to meet with us. Uh, let's pray. God in heaven, we thank you for today, for your goodness and love. Lord, we're thankful for the opportunity of being here this morning, the opportunity of being in your house. Lord, we're thankful uh, that uh, your word promises us where two or three are gathered, there you are in the midst. Uh, Lord, we're thankful that as we come to worship you in spirit and in truth, that we have the opportunity of hearing uh, from heaven, to hear uh, what it is that you would have for us, a message that applies directly uh, to us as individuals. Lord, I pray that we would listen uh, with open ears and an open heart, that we would be attentive to what it is uh, you're trying to do in our lives. Lord, help us uh, to make decisions. Help us to make commitments, Lord, to be what it is you've called us to, to be good neighbors, to be faithful to the one who is faithful to us. Lord, we ask these things in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. The first thing that we see as we're looking at uh, that this is a good exchange, There's a, uh, it starts off uh, with the two. It talks about a lawyer that stood uh, uh, and he asked Jesus, it says that he tempted him, saying, what, uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Even though uh, most would believe this was, a, uh, this was trying to get, uh, trying to, uh, the lawyer was trying to get uh, Jesus to say something maybe he sh uh, shouldn't or get him to stumble over his words or, or whatever the case may be. Even though uh, this may be the truth, the reality is this is always a good question for everybody to answer. Uh, this is always a good question for everybody to have answered in their life. Jesus gives an understanding. This lawyer, this person who was versed or this person that, was, uh, that had, had studied and was well educated in the law and in, uh, and in God's word, the Old Testament, he, he absolutely understood. And so Jesus, in response to, uh, to this first question uh, that was asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The, uh, Jesus addressed it, and instead of coming right out and answering the question, uh, Jesus gives him the opportunity to answer for himself. As he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, what's written in the law and how readest thou? He asked the individual who is well-versed in Scripture, uh, what does the Bible have to say? What does Scripture have to say it takes in order for a person uh, to have eternal life? And we'll look at it in a little while, but I'd, uh, I'd be doing my Lord and Savior a disservice if we didn't answer the question uh, as it's been uh, addressed to Jesus. We recognize that, uh, that if we are going to inherit eternal life according to the New Testament, Jesus self says uh, uh, that uh, He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man can comes to the Father, but by Him, Jesus is the only way for us to inherit eternal life. Uh, the New Testament gives us an understanding that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of our sin is death, but that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, because God so loved the world that He gave Jesus as a, as a price, as a payment, as a sacrifice for the sins of all of humanity. And if we will confess, if we will believe, if we will put our trust in Jesus Christ, that we could be saved from our sin. That's an amazing promise that God gives us. If we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9 tells us, if we confess, He is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what it takes in order for us to inherit eternal life. None of us are perfect. And so uh, as a result of none of us being perfect, none of us deserve. And because none of us deserve and all of us have... Uh, paid that first class ticket to an eternity separated from God by the acts that we commit, uh, the only hope that we have is Jesus Christ. And so he is the way, the truth, and the life. That's what we must do to inherit eternal life. That's what you must do to inherit eternal life. What an amazing truth it is that, uh, that, that, uh, that gift of God is available to every single one of us. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior today, if you don't know that you have the promise of eternal life, the offer from God Almighty is resting on your plate. We recognize through uh, Scripture, as the, uh, as the lawyer asked Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, look, uh, what, do you, what does the Scripture say? What's written in the law? How, do, how is it that you read it? He gives the lawyer an opportunity to answer. 
And this is how he answers. He said unto him in verse 27, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. By the way, Jesus tells him this is a good answer because it is a good answer. This is the first part of the answer. This is a, uh, the part of the answer that deals with our relationship with God. It's important for us to realize as, as we're going to see him avoid this portion of the question, this is something that can be faked on the outside but can't be faked on the inside. God knows if we're giving lip service, God knows how real or how uh, legitimate our worship towards him is. Uh, loving the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, strength, everything about us, it's all consuming. We must love him with every part of our being. And the second part is this, love thy neighbor as thyself. As he avoids this, before the lawyer answers or uh, asks the next question in this exchange, we see how he skirts around the issue of loving the Lord, almost as if to say, uh, tell Jesus that he already has that under control. By the way, loving the Lord with all our heart, our mind, our strength, our soul, if that's true, it comes forth. It comes, uh, it comes out in the second part of this command, loving our neighbor as ourself. That's a natural response. If we love the Lord the way that we're supposed to, we're going to love each other the way that we're supposed to. I'll say amen to that. Jesus said, thou hast answered right, this do and thou shalt live. If you think that you have it under control, if you think that you've mastered all of these things, Go ahead and follow through with those and you'll earn your own way to heaven. Jesus says that, but understanding none of us can earn our own way to heaven. None of us can fulfill uh, all of the law. None of us can, uh, can be perfect in every, in every way as is alluded to here. He says, if you do all these things, you'll live. But willing to justify himself, verse 29 he said unto Jesus, who's my neighbor? And really, this is going to be the, the major thrust of this message. The second part of this question, or the second question that's asked, who is my neighbor? I ask you the same question that, uh, that, uh, that the lawyer asked Jesus, because it's important for us to understand, it's important for us to have that, uh, that foundation laid in our own life. If we are to love the Lord with all our heart, mind, soul, strength, all those things, and we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. Uh, it's uh, important for us to know who our neighbor is. Jesus addresses this again. Instead of coming right out and answering the question, Jesus gives a parable that we've already read, and we'll break it down in a few seconds. Uh, he does this because the who isn't as important as the how. The who our neighbor is isn't as important as the how we are to treat our neighbor. The travelers that are mentioned here, as we continue to read, as he says, uh, who is my neighbor? Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from uh, Jerusalem to Jericho and fell amongst thieves. This is a, uh, about a 17-mile journey as he is walking, and he is walking through a place that is uh, that it's a, a treacherous place, caves uh, and uh, hiding places all along the way. It's a place where uh, thieves made it a point, and thieves uh, continually were in that place for the purpose of taking advantage of the purpose of uh, robbing individuals and taking what they had. So these were uh, really, we could say they were professional thieves. So he went from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell amongst these thieves. The Bible says that they stripped him of his raiment. That means they took everything that he had, including his clothing. They wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. The traveler was, that had been beaten and left for dead, he was probably of a Jewish descent based on the uh, manner in which Jesus is telling the story. Taking this 17-mile journey, these professional thieves draw, uh, jump out and uh, take hold of him. They took everything he had, like I said, including his clothes, beat him half to death and left him to die. There's not, a, there's not much of a uh, worse uh, case scenario that you can imagine that, uh, that this individual could fall into. Jesus responds to the question 
uh, 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 with, uh, with this question and with this story, with this peril, and we can gain an obvious understanding uh, that, that by the way Jesus addresses the question that anybody and everybody would be considered our neighbor. It has more to do with the proximity to us than anything else. Again, it's not how much that's in question, or, or it's not so much uh, who our neighbor is as how we are treating our neighbor. That's the question. Jesus answered and gives a response in verse 37 as we looked at. Uh, he says, and he said, uh, he showed mercy unto him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do thou likewise. Verse 36, uh, which now of these thinkest is the neighbor unto him that fell amongst thieves. So we're given an understanding of who the neighbor is. And then let's break down exactly what happened. After he was beaten and left for dead, and after everything that he had was taken from him, uh, and after uh, he fell amongst these thieves and his uh, life was, uh, was uh, captivated with this tragedy at this moment, being left for dead, we pick up in verse 33. This is our good example. Our, our verse 31, our good example starts in verse 33. After he was beat up, left for dead, by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. We see as we're looking at these examples that one decided to go the other way. Understanding that a priest, uh, uh, this was an individual that was supposed to be an example of how to treat others. One who was supposed to be well educated in uh, the ways of God and the, uh, the, the ministry uh, of God towards people. This is one who should have known better. He definitely uh, should have known not to walk the other way, but that's the decision that he decided to make as he was traveling along and as he was uh, going that same route, he sees an individual laying in the dirt who's been beat up and uh, uh, left uh, mostly uh, with no clothing on and left for dead. And what does the Bible say that he do does? He goes to the other side of the path and goes around him. He avoids the individual that's in pain. He avoids the individual uh, that's been overtaken. He avoids the individual that's in a need. Needs come in all shapes and sizes. In our story here, we see an individual in very real need of physical help. It can come in the way of needing financial help, needing assistance in so many different ways. I think it's an absolute shame that God's people choose to avoid those that are in need. I have a good friend of mine that uh, early on in his ministry, I went to college with him. He, uh, his father was a well-known preacher, and his, his father did, uh, uh, did something that he wasn't supposed to, and as a result, it ruined his ministry and ruined his mission work and uh, disqualified him from, uh, from uh, the, the office of a pastor and those kind of things, and he was a well-known individual. And, and my friend said that uh, through all of the things that his dad did, it felt like everybody he knew was taking it out on him. Not considering the fact that at that moment in his life, his biggest hero uh, had done something so uh, deplorable and so despicable that it, that it shook his own faith. And as a result uh, of his dad's decision, uh, people were taking it out. It seemed like on him, he said, I was at the, uh, I was at the, the greatest need in my life. I was at a moment of uh, my greatest vulnerability and greatest weakness because of all the things that happened. And that was the moment when I needed God's people to rally around me and help me. And he said, it seemed like everybody abandoned me. Nobody would answer my phone calls. Nobody would call me and see how I was doing. And this is a preacher. It's a shame to hear God's people avoiding. It's a shame to... Hear testimony of God's people, those who know better, avoiding to help those in need. This priest walked on the other side. 
He didn't want to be bothered with it. He ignored uh, the need. He ignored uh, what the individual was going through. He didn't care uh, to help him in any way. He was willing to neglect his office. He was willing to neglect what he knew to be right simply for his own comfort. No doubt he was distracted with something he had to do. No doubt he was distracted with things he had on his plate. Uh, no doubt he was distracted by the, uh, by the things that he was planning on do throughout the day and that, uh, that, that was on schedule. I can go ahead and I'll say this. Don't let your schedule distract you from what God's called you to do. Don't let your plans... Don't let your ambitions distract you from what it is God has called you to do. We see this priest seeing this individual in need and choosing to go around him and walk down the other side of the path. And then we get to the next one, uh, the next individual. Uh, verse 32, and likewise a Levite. This is an individual that was a, uh, a helper or an asset or maybe even a, an apprentice to uh, the priest when he was uh, going by that place. The Bible says that he came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. This was an individual that also should have known better than to leave an individual that's in need. He was a priest's assistant. Assistant. He had saw the priest do wrong and really followed in his footsteps. As God's people, it's important for us to, uh, to recognize our respons responsibility to those that are in need, but it's also important for us to understand our responsibility to the next generation. The things that we do the actions and the, uh, the heart or the, the lack of love that we have, the, our willingness to avoid and ignore and neglect and be distracted from what God has called us to do, it is going to pass on to those that are around us. He decided to, to go and to gawk at and to, to look. He, he goes and uh, you can imagine it's like passing by a, a car accident and, and there's always more accidents when there's an accident on the highway because uh, people are slowing down and stretching out and looking, not paying attention to what's going on in front of them and it, it causes more accidents and it causes uh, more damage. It, it's kind of like that. He, he sees an individual that, uh, uh, that's been beat up and stripped of his clothing and left for dead and the Bible says that he goes and looks. Uh, he's gawking at him. He's kind of uh, an individual that is uh, 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 that's just uh, looking. It's like uh, uh, passing a car when an emergency vehicle, uh, the emergency vehicles and law enforcement are all around. We can't help but look, and that's where he was. Uh, but, but it's followed through with what happens when we see an accident. We try to uh, scrutinize or we try to surmise what, what it was that took place. We wonder, what in the world were they thinking? By the way, I'm not just talking about physical, uh, maybe a car accident or, or the physical uh, situation that this individual finds himself in. We see Christians, we see God's people making foolish decisions and doing things that they know that they're not supposed to. We see individuals that have uh, fallen victim to the enemy and instead of being there to lovingly embrace them and uh, to guide them and nurture them back in the way that they should go, we scrutinize their decisions. We say, what in the world were they thinking? They know better than that. This is what he should have done, and yet this is what he did instead. How did they not see that end coming? And then we piously say, well, I'll pray for them. We suppose that the hurt that they're feeling, the anguish that they're in, is a result of the judgment of God. Well, that's what they get for living the way that they live. By the way, these are priests, these are Jews, and he's speaking uh, of, uh, of an individual that's fallen victim and fallen uh, prey to these thieves. This is someone that they should have been willing to help. We suppose that the, 
that the hurt that people are feeling is a result of the way that they live like Job's friends. Well, if you lived right, then this, the Lord wouldn't have allowed this to happen to you. We see the things that are going on around us and we see families being ripped apart and we see homes being destroyed and we say, oh, that's just the world in which we live. That's a lame excuse. We say somebody will show up and help them, but we're unwilling to do our part. We see that one decided to go around, one decided to gawk at the, uh, the, the tragedy that the individual was in. But in our good example, we see one deciding to give attention. He saw a need. He saw an individual that was hurt, that was beat up, uh, that was left for dead. And as a result of the situation that that individual was in, he looked on him with compassion, not with a judgmental heart, but he looked on him with compassion. What the Samaritan would do as a result of seeing him and having compassion and uh, uh, what he was going to do wasn't out of duty, but out of love. We see uh, the Bible tells us that he came. Came to where he was. Came to the individual that was hurting. I think most of us uh, as God's a uh, self-professing Christian as God's people, most of us uh, can see the things going on around us and recognize that there's a need. I think all of us can recognize that there's a need. I think that God's people as, as Christians, that we can all look on that and have compassion and say, you know what, I, I, I wish that they weren't in that situation. I wish that, the, uh, that they could rise above that. I wish they weren't going through the torment that they were going through. But I think that most of us stop right there. We see the need and we have enough compassion to want something better for them. But we see the Samaritan came where the person was, came where the need was. We all can have emotional response to horrible things going on around us. But like I said, I think most of us stop there. The good Samaritan saw a person in need, had compassion, and acted upon it. By the way, if this was a Jewish individual, they considered the Samaritans to be the lowest of the low. They considered them to be uh, less than human in some ways. Not worth as much as one of God's chosen people. Viewing them by the last name that they had, the place in which they were born, how much money they had, or uh, recognize their uh, descendants, uh, however it is you want to look at, they, they just were considered less than the Jewish individuals were. They mistreated them, called them names, made fun of them, and yet this Samaritan saw an individual in need had compassion and acted upon it. It also tells us that he went to help. The Bible says that he promptly bandaged his wounds, that he poured oil uh, to soothe the pain, that he uh, poured wine, which would be used to cleanse. He put on, he put the, uh, the wounded man on his beast uh, to assist him. He placed him in the inn for the purpose of comfort. He proceeded to care for him and to provide uh, uh, for his healing. He paid the rest. He paid for his rest and recovery to provide for him peace. He promised to return for the purpose of providing the individual with hope. We see that this uh, Samaritan had enough compassion to act upon it, that he was willing to go to where he was and help him in his time of need. We also see that he was willing to sacrifice all these things, the, the bandage, the oil, the, uh, the wine, the putting him on his beast, uh, the placing him in the inn, paying for his care so that he could heal, uh, the, uh, paying the, uh, promising to pay the rest of the bill when the time come and promising uh, to come back. All of this is a picture of the sacrifice he was willing to make. Everything that the Samaritan did cost him. It cost him money. 
We already saw that the Samaritans were, uh, were, uh, were emotionally and uh, physically and mentally abused by the, uh, by the Jewish uh, crowd, and so it also cost him his pride in helping someone that had been so cruel in the past. He sacrificed his own comfort by putting the, uh, the wounded man on his mule. It cost him his energy as he walked beside the, uh, the beast to the end. It cost him his time. There's no doubt he had other things he could have been doing. A good neighbor doesn't look at what it costs to minister to another. A good neighbor looks at what it'll cost if he doesn't. He saw a man in need. He had been beaten, stripped of his clothes. Everything was taken from him, and he was left for dead. And he didn't look at the color of his skin. He didn't look uh, at the, uh, the things that had happened in the past. He didn't look at, uh, at his current situation and judge why he was there. He simply said, there's a man that's in need of help. And as a result uh, of him seeing that need, he had compassion, and he acted upon it, willing to sacrifice. Like I said, there's all sorts of needs that people have. Financial is a big one. Physical, obviously, we can see that here. But what about emotional needs? What about uh, uh, those that we know that have spiritual needs? There's no greater need that an individual has than to hear the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And yet we keep that message to ourselves. How about personal needs? A listening ear, a shoulder to cry on, words of encouragement, a helping hand. A mental escape or a bearer of burdens. There are all sorts of needs that are represented by all sorts of people. There are all sorts of needs that are represented just by the folks that are in here today. We see the Good Samaritan as a good example. And then it closes out with verses 36 and 37. As Jesus says, Who of these thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell amongst thieves? Who do you think it is that was his neighbor? And he said unto him, He that showed mercy on him. By the way, that's the wrong answer. All of them were his neighbor. Every one of them. The priest... The Levite and the Samaritan all were this man's neighbor. But only one had enough love and compassion to do something about it. Jesus gives him an understanding, gives him a command. He says, uh, go and do thou likewise. We've already talked about the salvation that's been provided by Jesus Christ, what it takes in order to inherit eternal life. As Jesus uh, tells him that his answer is right when he says, Love the Lord with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus gives this parable, but it's important for us to recognize that Jesus demonstrated everything that he said. In his own life, in his own ministry, in leaving heaven and coming to this earth and ministering to humanity and dying for us, he demonstrated every aspect of what it is to be a good neighbor. He saw a need, the need of humanity. He felt compassion on us. He came to where we were. He offered us help and he gave sacrificially. So Jesus demonstrated it, but Jesus also demands it. He says, look, if you know that this is what it takes, if you know that this is what is required of you, it is your responsibility to go and do that likewise. That's our responsibility. That's our call. If you are a blood-bought believer, if you uh, claim the shed blood of Jesus Christ as the payment for your sin, if you uh, claim to be a Christian, if you claim and uh, have assurance that you're on your way to heaven no matter what comes in this life, you have the responsibility from Almighty God, you have a responsibility from your Lord and Savior to be willing to go to anybody and everybody that's in need. That means uh, the the loss that's on the outside of the church that's uh, that does things as 
so reprehensible that it turns our stomach. Uh, the, those that are uh, living in opposition to what's right and those that, uh, that tread on our freedoms and on our country's uh, foundation, th those that make us angry. It's our responsibility to see the need, have compassion, go where they are, offer help, and be willing to sacrifice. Jesus demonstrated it. Jesus demands it. But as a Christian, one of the greatest aspects of this is the fact that Jesus delights in it. Another parable as Jesus is uh, speaking to his disciples in Matthew 25, verses 21, and, and in verse 23, he says, uh, talking of a, a servant that was obedient to his master, he says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, as he's given the parable of giving out the talents. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. He says this uh, twice in Matthew chapter 25. He gives an understanding, uh, gives uh, uh, the, those that are uh, Christians, those that put themselves in subjection to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he gives them an understanding that Jesus takes pleasure, he takes delight in us being faithful to what he's called us to do. We sang about our chains being gone, and afterwards I asked, uh, you know, Say amen if that's you. And everybody responded. He's been absolutely overwhelmingly good and faithful to us in every single way. He's been good to me. And there's nothing I want to hear more from my Lord and Savior when I enter into heaven than well done, thou good and faithful servant. Not because I want to be able to pat myself on the back. Not because I want to go to, uh, to everybody else that made it and say, see, look what it is that I've done. Look, uh, listen to what it is that the Lord said to me. He, he's, uh, he's, pleased, uh, he's pleased with the effort that I gave. It has nothing to do with that. I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, because he means that much to me. Because anything that I could possibly do that brings him pleasure is worth giving it my very dead level best effort. And if that means uh, loving those that are sometimes unlovable, if that means reaching out to those uh, that are seemingly out of our reach, if that means sacrificing, giving so that others can have, if that means doing and laboring and being there for others, then so be it, because he means that much to me. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's the good that's expected out of us. The lawyer comes to Jesus and tries to stump him. He says, uh, what do I have to do to go to heaven? Important for all of us to know. He says, love the Lord with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's exactly what it takes. Go and do that, and you'll have eternal life. The problem is, all of us fall short. There are times where our ambitions and our desires come before the Lord. So in all honesty, none of us can live up to, uh, to just the first part. Each and every one of us are in need of help. Each and every one of us are in uh, need of outside source and outside power. Each and every one of us are in desperate need. And Jesus has filled that need. And as a result of Jesus filling that need in our life, we have the responsibility of loving our neighbors as ourselves. Loving them enough to tell them the truth. Loving them enough to be willing to help. Loving them enough to sacrifice. Loving them enough uh, to go out of our way to provide for them. We can't really say that we love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength if we're willing to see others pass from this life into the next. Never having heard the gospel never having seen it lived out in our life. We can't say that we love the Lord with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength if we're willing to allow people to die in their sin. We've got to be willing to go, to see the need, to have compassion, to go where they are, to offer them help, and be willing to make sacrifice all for the purpose of leading them 
the foot of the cross. What must I do to enter into heaven? What must I do to have eternal life? And who is my neighbor? With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask our musicians to make their way to the front. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask that you would be honest with yourself, with nobody looking around. This morning, could you say with an honest heart that you've done what's necessary to have eternal life? That you followed through with, uh, with uh, confession and forgiveness uh, that's, uh, that's uh, required out of us uh, and that's provided for us in the New Testament? Have you put all your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Do you love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Does it come, uh, come to, uh, to pass or does it come to fulfillment in the lifestyle that you live? Do you really love him the way that you're supposed to love him? By the way, the answer to that question could be seen in the second question, our second part of the question. Do you love people the way that you're supposed to? When was the last time you told somebody about salvation? When was the last time you told somebody about the realities of heaven and hell? When was the last time that you were honest with somebody about the, uh, the decisions that they were making and the sin that they were living in and the destruction that it was bringing their way? When was the last time you were honest with somebody and telling them that Jesus Christ died for them, that He loved them enough that He gave His life for them? I can't answer that question, only you can. And the answer to that question reveals whether or not we love people the way we love ourselves. I don't know about you, but I fall short. I don't know about you, but as I think of who my neighbor is, when I consider those that I have influence over, those that I come in contact with on a daily basis, if they truly are my neighbors, then I'm falling short. 